you'll open your Bibles, we're in Hebrews chapter 9 this morning. Hebrews chapter 9. In Chronicles of Narnia, if you've seen the movie or read the books, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know that Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy discover this wardrobe in a side room. It looks like an ordinary um, wardrobe, plain and simple enough. And as the scene, at least from the movie, plays through my mind's eye, you'll recall that they open this seemingly normal wardrobe And as they try to hide there, at least the first time, the smell of mothballs and old musty coats overwhelms them as they try to make their way behind the coats to the back of the wardrobe, only to stumble into a snow-covered land. The normal gave way to the mysterious. A land of Mr. Thomas and Mr. and Ms. Beaver, the great white witch, and of course, Aslan, the Lion King. The mundane piece of furniture suddenly was, for them, a gateway to the marvelous, a mysterious other world. Now, if you kind of hold that idea in your mind, as we come to chapter 9, the author, the preacher of Hebrews, as we've often said, this is a sermon, preached to a group of Christians who were on the verge of going back to Judaism or falling away from the faith due to immaturity or apostasy or because they could see and smell Judaism and not as much Christianity, perhaps, the author has labored the point of the superiority of Christ, and he's given us a whole list of examples of what Christ is superior to, the angels, to Abraham, to Moses, to the covenant, the old covenant versus the new covenant. And he's trying to keep them from turning their back. And so this morning, as we read these first 14 verses of chapter 9, we're going to put up in front of your mind's eye and in your mind this morning the Old Covenant and the New Covenant as found in the Old and New Testament. And you're going to be able to see for yourself the superiority of Christ. And we're going to do all that in 15 minutes, so... Strap in and hold on. Let's stand as we do each week. For we believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice, perfect in everything that it affirms and teaches. I'll begin reading in Hebrews 9, beginning in verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room there was a lampstand and the table with the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place, and behind the second curtain was the room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold ark, gold-covered ark of the covenant. The ark contained the jar, gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered into the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this 
that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applied until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean Sanctify them so that they, can, they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your most holy word, but we pray that we would see no man save Jesus Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. In the first ten verses of this chapter, we have a relatively brief description of the tabernacle, that tent that would eventually transform into a building, the temple, that God gave to Moses on the mountain of Sinai. When he gave the law, he also gave the directions for building the tabernacle. After he had brought them out of bondage in Egypt, he redeemed them first, and then he gave them the law. And part of that law was this tabernacle made up actually of three areas, the general area where sacrifices were administered, a holy place, and then a holy of holies. A place where their holy God could come and be with and amongst the people, but yet not too close. Right? Nobody was allowed in the holy of holies except the high priest and only once a year there. And all of the furnishings of the tabernacle were a foreshadow of what Christ would eventually be. And we can see that if we took just a minute this morning to look at that. The outer court, the inner court, and then the most holy of holies. The lampstand, the seven-branched menorah that stood there with constantly lit in the holy place, kept by the priest. To light the way. Jesus one day would come as the light of the world. The showbread. The bread that was made fresh every week and laid by the priest on the consecrated table there. Jesus would come and say, I am the bread of life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Similarly, the... the, the incense. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The incense that went up as prayers and offerings to God, now Jesus says, those come through me. And then as we enter the Holy of Holies with the great ark there covered in gold, with the two cherubim, hovering over the mercy seat where God was said to have abided when he came and dwelt in the tabernacle and the Shekinah glory came down and covered the entire tent. The people were known to stay away. That room was only the high priest was allowed to go in and then only on the Day of Atonement once a year and only after he had made 
sacrifice for his own sins and for the sins of the people, was he able to go in, and when he went in, his responsibility was to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice over the mercy seat such that the very ark of God was covered in sacrificial blood of goats and animals. A tent that was beautifully made, covered with multicolored fabrics and gold and bronze and silver adornments. Oh, the glory it must have been. Always facing east. against the immortal, the eternal Jesus Christ. The lampstand, the showbread, the incense, even the Ark of the Covenant representing the Old Covenant overwhelmed by the magnificent beauty of the blood of Jesus Christ. For once Christ came, his blood, as we have already read in weeks gone by, was sufficient enough to save. It did not have to be repeated. His blood did not have to be shed time and time and time again. And as we've said each week for the last three weeks, that great veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies so that no man could live and see the ark ripped in two from top to bottom at the death of Jesus Christ as a new way had been opened. It is an indictment on the first century Jewish nation that they sewed that curtain back up. Ripped by God, sewed back up by man. Jesus has opened a better way. No longer are sacrifices required, for he has come to save. And his blood, as, as the writer has argued, the blood of goats could not cleanse the consciousness. It was only an external cleansing, one that had to be repeated. And yet it is the blood of Christ that is capable and able to cleanse even the conscience. So that it is not only an external cleaning, but an internal spiritual cleaning. That's why the blood of Christ is so much better. It cleanses what Bunyan calls the wounded conscience. It is the eternal blood of the Son. And so it is capable of cleansing our conscience. It is, we sing about this all the time, don't we? We sing, we're washed in the blood, we're saved through the blood. There is a fountain filled with blood. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. We talk a lot about the blood of Christ. But it is the better sacrifice, the author argues here and shows us so plainly. It is a better sacrifice. It is God's way of salvation. The Old Testament was merely a foreshadow of what Christ's work could do for you. If you had lived in Old Testament times, you would have had to bring sacrifice over and over and over again, your conscience never being cleansed. And yet, with the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, His ascension into the new tabernacle in heaven, to the very right hand of the Father, He is able by His blood to cleanse your conscience. The purpose of the blood is to wash away our sins, to pay for the penalty of our sins. That blood of Christ is literally your lifeline. So what does this have to do with missions? Why don't I preach this on Mission Sunday? 
I preach this on Mission Sunday so that you can think about the fact that this blood that has been shed for the cleansing of your conscience, that you have done nothing to deserve it. As we said in Sunday school, we love him because he first loved us and sent his son as a propitiation, a cleansing for our sins. Well, if that is your reward, how can we not share it? How can you not in your own consciousness not want to share such a gift that has been given to you? You are simply one blind, dumb, thirsty, dying person in the desert showing another dumb, blind, dying person in the desert where water is. We should want to give all that we have, not just money, but time and talent as well as treasure, to telling others about Christ. Do you have any friends that aren't Christians? Or have you so insulated yourself that you live in the shadow of the cross, but you don't want to venture beyond that? Or do you have people in your midst that you just say, you know, it's just not appropriate to talk about Jesus? Is the fact that God's blood has come to you a fire in your bones, as Jeremiah said. As we come on Mission Sunday, as we think about how this covenant family supports the Great Commission, we support it with our time, we support it with our talent, and we support it with our treasure. God has commanded us to go and make disciples. That's on Broad Street, and that's in Spain, and that's wherever your sphere of influence is. I beg you that the word of God would be a fire shut up in your bones that you are so weary you cannot keep it in anymore that you want to tell others about Jesus. Amen.